time we left off, it was, you know, fun TV time. Um, but we're going to get back into uh, really getting heavily into what we were talking about with GFR. Does anybody remember what the barriers are for deciding whether or not a substance is going to be filtered? Size. Size. Charge. Charge. What is the maximum size? 69 kilodaltons, okay, which is roughly the, the size of your albumin, okay? So anything that's bigger than that is not getting through. Anything that is smaller than 5.5 kilodaltons can filter very freely. Anything that's a little bit bigger than that, but still less than 69, is going to be filtered. It's just going to be filtered a little bit more slowly. The bigger the molecule, the more slowly it's going to filter. The, this is from the previous lecture, but just as a quick reminder, we're going to talk a lot about the different types of molecules and how they're going to be processed in the nephron. So a substance can be filtered only. So all of them are going to be filtered. It can either stop there, and whatever's filtered ends up in the urine, period. No change. It can be filtered and partially reabsorbed, which means that you have a set amount that's filtered, and then the amount that you're going to excrete will be a little bit less than that, but you still will be excreting some in the urine. It could be filtered and completely reabsorbed, which means that you have part of it being filtered because of its size and its charge. It will get filtered along with everything else, but as, it goes, as the filtrate goes through the nephron, it will be completely reabsorbed, so you shouldn't have anything showing up in the urine. The last one is it can be filtered and secreted, which means that you are going to actually excrete more than you're filtering. So your filtration rate will only give you a piece of that information because you have to take into account that you also have the addition of that particular molecule in the tubular portion as well. So, we have talked a lot, quite extensively, about our hydrostatic and our colloid osmotic pressures. What do you notice that's different in terms of all the parameters that we discussed when we did microcirculation compared to what we see here? What's missing? The colloid pressure Bowman space. Yes, Bowman space, <coughs> colloid osmotic pressure. Why is that measurable? <coughs> so you can assume it's roughly zero. What doesn't get filtered? Proteins. Proteins. So there aren't really proteins and other large molecules that are going to contribute significantly to a colloid osmotic pressure inside of Bowman space. Bowman space is roughly the home of protein-free filtrates. So you can estimate about a zero value for the colloid osmotic pressure inside Bowman space. All the other parameters are going to stay the same. You have the pro-filtration forces, and you have the pro-reabsorption uh, forces. Hydrostatic pressure is going to promote fluid moving away from whatever compartment you're talking about. Colloid osmotic is going to draw it towards it. So in this case, the glomerular hydrostatic pressure runs right <coughs> about 60 millimeters of mercury. <coughs> the colloid osmotic is about 32, which would oppose filtration, and the Bowman capsule Hydrostatic pressure is about 18. So if you add those two together, you're going to get roughly a 10 millimeter of mercury. Anywhere between 10 and 15 is the average filtration difference that you're going to see between the pro-filtration forces and the forces that will oppose it. Okay? So figuring out the net filtration pressure, exactly the same equation that we used before. But to figure out the actual filtration rate, what do you have to multiply that by? constant, okay? Kf is your ultrafiltration constant. And that constant takes into account a couple of different things. So right here, that Kf. Kf is going to look at the hydraulic conductivity of the membrane, which is just a fancy way to say what is the proportionality constant <coughs> for the likelihood of flux, volume across that membrane. How permeable is it? Okay? The hydraulic conductivity is one part of the ultrafiltration constant. The second part is the surface area. Okay? So how likely is it that something can get across, that water and fluid can get across the membrane? 
and <coughs> how much space does that water have in order to cross? How many lanes are open, so to speak? Okay, so you have to take the entire ultrafiltration pressure, which is that equation there, in order to figure out what the pressure is, and then multiply that by the conditions for that particular membrane at that given time and under those conditions, because you can change the surface area. The hydraulic conductivity is something that isn't going to alter all that much, but the surface area can change. You guys remember when I was mentioning mesangial cells being specialized smooth muscle cells? One of the things that they can do by contracting along with the basement membrane is affecting the surface area for this filtration to occur. So it will actually alter that ultrafiltration constant. <clears throat> now, this is the same equation that we did before, it's just written a little bit differently. So if we're looking at these two parameters here, is this going to be pro or opposing filtration? <coughs> are these your filtration forces or are these the ones that would promote reabsorption? Filtration. Filtration. Okay? These are going to promote filtration. These are going to promote reabsorption. Okay? So if you look at them together, all you're really doing, sorry, hang on a second, I rewrote it down below. This is, let me rewrite this. Your pro filtration and your pro filtration. Oops, if I read the first one. Mm -hmm. Okay, your pro reabsorption ones are these guys opposing filtration. These are going to force filtration. Okay, I rearranged this and put it down. Well, does anybody mind if I go on? It'll get rid of my annotation in this slide, please. I rewrote it down here so that we could look at what I was intending to say above. <laughs> your pro filtration and your pro reabsorption. Okay, you want to take a look at adding together the forces that will work together to get water out of the capillary and you'll take away, subtract the forces that are going to move it in. Which one of these is negligible? This guy. So this guy is roughly zero. Okay? So for all intents and purposes, kind of forget that. You're not really going to have value for that anytime you do a calculation. <coughs> this ultrafiltration pressure is going to tell you what is going to move at the beginning of the glomerular capillary bed, coming out of the afternoon arterial. It is actually going to change as you move through those capillaries. As blood passes through the glomerular capillaries, that PUF is going to change till it gets to the point where it's zero. You're going to hit that equilibrium point where you have these forces balanced out as you move along the contact. Kind of like what we talked about in terms of reaching equilibrium for gas exchange across the respiratory capillaries. It's the same basic principle here. You start off with a difference of about 10 to 15 millimeters of mercury, and it's going to dwindle as you move across. Why is that going to occur? What's happening as What's happening to the content of the blood as it's moving through the capillary bed? It gets filtered, so it reaches equilibrium. It gets it gets filtered, but what is being filtered? All the proteins, not proteins, but all the stuff. Everything but your proteins and your cells. Yeah. So anything that's smaller than albumin is getting filtered. So your fluids getting filtered. Some of your solutes are getting filtered, but not the big ones that are contributing to your colonosmotic. Which means what happens? to the colosmotic pressure of the plasma as you get toward the end of the capillary bed. It gets more concentrated, right? Because you're losing fluid, but you're not losing those proteins. What happens to your hydrostatic pressure and blood? It gets a little bit less, okay? So, as we're moving along here, what's really happening is this is the biggest change. The biggest change that you're gonna see in terms of your pressure is that concentration of those proteins. You'll notice that there's not really a significant change in your hydrostatic pressure. That will drop by the time you get to the paratubular capillaries because of, or depending on, 
the level of resistance of that efferent arterial. Don't forget, we have two arterioles on either side of this glomerular capillary bed. Because of that, we have a lot more strict and tight control over the diameter of the blood vessel that is sending it out of the glomerulus. Okay, so we can regulate GFR very, very tightly because we have equal opportunities for control on either side. So the big one that's going to change is concentrating those glomerular capillary cholinosmotic pressure. So effectively what's really going to happen is by the time you get from your afferent, so over here is afferent, and over here is your efferent arterial, you'll start off with your net filtration pressure. As you move and fluid gets filtered, the filtration rate will start to get smaller and smaller as you start to concentrate these guys. Okay. We're going to concentrate these. So these are going to actually go up. The collar osmotic increases, <coughs> so the whole net ultrafiltration pressure is going to decrease. On the efferent side, you do have the possibility of arterial vasoconstriction or dilation. And that will affect the hydrostatic pressure that ends up going into the paratubular capillaries. Typically, we have extra renal hormones and compounds that can affect this, <coughs> as well as autonomic nervous system that will be able to regulate the degree of contractility of the smooth muscles surrounding those arterioles. So at the end of the day, you'll see a set amount of filtration starting off between 10 and 15. It'll get lower and lower and lower until you get past the capillary bed. Passing through the efferent arterial and going into the paratubular capillaries, your hydrostatic pressure is going to drop. You have concentrated your colloid osmotic, which means the conditions are really right for fluid and solute movement to come back into the nephron. So, if you look at the actual value, calculating everything in there, so we're looking at the um, forces that favor versus the forces that oppose, and you see that there will be no, and it's net filtration, okay? It's your net ultrafiltration. By the time they get balanced, you really won't have any more <coughs> filtration occurring. You will have hit that equilibrium. Okay? We have a couple different ways that we can regulate it. Um, auto regulation is something we're going to get into when we get to, well, we're going to start talking about it now, but we'll go into the macula densa and the tubular glomerulus <coughs> mechanism. That's going to be toward the end of today. We started to introduce the macula densa at the end of last time. So today we're going to talk about exactly how that works. So there's an auto-regulation. This is something that the kidney does all by itself. Even if you take it out of the body and you perfuse it with erythrocyte-free plasma, it still will be able to auto-regulate. Okay, so this is something that is intrinsic to the kidney itself. It doesn't need any input or any compounds that are produced outside of itself. So the kidney itself, it, it can take care of itself. It can regulate its own GFR rate based on the contents of the tubule itself. There's also extrinsic. So you have ANS, which is your autonomic nervous system, sympathetic and parasympathetic. You have control of smooth muscle contraction. That's going to be a big determinant as well for how much filtrate is actually produced per unit time. So you can raise or lower filtration rate based on stimuli coming from the ANS. Your hydrostatic pressure inside of your capillary bed, that's your biggest determinant. It's the one that is going to be most easily controlled. Why? How do you control that? Exactly. Basoactive effects of the arterioles that basically the glomerular capillaries are sandwiched in between. If you have two resistance vessels on either side, you can greatly control the degree to which hydrostatic pressure is altered just by changing resistance. Why do we care about this? Capillaries in general, are they particularly strong and hardy? No. What happens if you have 
massive changes in blood pressure. What could happen to your kidney bed if the kidney wasn't able to respond to that even without getting extra renal signals? You destroy it. You could destroy your capillaries just by having an increase in blood pressure. If you're, don't, if you're not able to alter that arterial resistance on the apparent side to reduce that hydrostatic pressure, you could damage the kidneys. If you are not able to alter the efferent side and you have a low blood pressure, you can dilate the arterial, but if your blood pressure is already low, you need to have it even higher than what you would normally be able to attain just by dilating the arterial, uh, the apparent arterial. So how do you do that? You constrict its ability to move. Okay, so dilating the afferent side will allow it to come in at a higher pressure, but constricting the efferent side basically creates that bottleneck, which will elevate your hydrostatic pressure. So we're going to see this again. But all of these things allow you a two-pronged approach to very tight regulation of hydrostatic pressure in the capillaries. So what happens if we take the afferent arterial and we Tighten it up. Smaller diameter, smaller radius. Ra the resistance goes up. What happens as the resistance goes up? What happens to the blood flow? The blood flow is going to go down, right? If you constrict the vessel, you're basically making it so that your blood flow will decrease. You have a set pressure, okay? Your resistance goes up, right? Q equals P over R. Yeah. Your resistance goes up, your flow is going to go down. If your flow goes down, what's going to happen to the hydrostatic pressure in the capillary? It's going to go down. If that goes down, what happens to your GFR? It's also going to go down. Because Bowman space is still a protein-free filtrate. So that's still zero. There is a set amount, assuming everything is fine, the hydrostatic pressure inside Bowman space is going to be relatively constant. So, you don't have to change the concentration of your proteins or your hyaluronic pressure stays the same. So the only thing that's really going to change is that drop in hydrostatic pressure. When that goes down, that's the main force for filtration. Your GFR will go down in response. Is there a way to increase hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space? If we have a nephron that's filled with filtrate and we don't have it surrounded by any smooth muscle cells, so you can't, you can't make the radius of the nephron smaller, what would be a way that you could actually increase the hydrostatic pressure in bone space? It's not a good thing. There's like a back of the There could be some kind of obstruction. If you have an obstruction and you're constantly trying to filter fluid, and it can't get through the tubule the way that it's supposed to, you can actually have a backup of fluid that causes an increase in hydrostatic pressure in Bowman space, which will reduce your GFR. So a blockage that could occur, maybe you have um, some kind of crystals that are forming, okay? You could have kidney stones that are going to start forming. Depending on where they form, if they form in the collecting duct, that filtrate that's continuing to be formed now has nowhere to go, or it can't move as well as it should that will reduce your overall GFR because of that increase in hydrostatic pressure on bone space. Okay, so just because <coughs> under normal circumstances we have the most control physiologically over glomerular hydrostatic, doesn't mean that other things can't change that can alter your GFR. It's just that physiologically this is the parameter that we have the most control over and it's the one that's normally fed back on. Okay? So, Higher afferent resistance, lower GFR, lower renal blood flow. How do we feel about that so far? Pretty good? Okay, what if we don't do anything to the afferent side and instead we constrict the efferent side? What is that going to do to blood flow? Increase, decrease, no change. How many think it's going to increase? How many think decrease? Very good. You're creating a bottleneck. 
So blood might still come in at a normal amount, but once you constrict that inferior arterial, you're creating a backlog. So the rate at which blood is flowing is going to drop. If that happens, what happens to your hydrostatic pressure? It's going to go up. Why? Because you're creating a bottleneck. The problem is with dropping the blood flow, either before or after, is that they can have opposite effects on that hydrostatic pressure, depending on which side you are slowing the blood flow down. Okay? So both of them cause a reduction in blood flow. But if you restrict the efferent side coming out, then there's nothing to slow down. There's a higher pressure of blood coming into the capillary bed and it's harder for it to get out. So the hydrostatic pressure is going to go up. What's that going to do to your GFR? It's going to increase your GFR. Okay? And if you increase your GFR, then you're going to have it more that is being filtered out, which means you're going to have an increase in the concentration of that colloid osmotic pressure. Plus, what happens when you get to the paratubular capillaries under this condition? You're going to have more reabsorption. Everybody see why? If you have a greater GFR, that's more filtrate produced per unit time, you are going to concentrate that the protein, the colloid osmotic pressure, is going to go up in the capillary bed. You've also constricted the manner in which the blood is going from the glomerular capillaries to the paratubular capillaries. If you're constricting it, you're passing it through a bigger resistance vessel, which means a bigger pressure drop. Remember the pre and post capillary resistors? Right? If you pass through a larger resistor, the pressure drop from hydrostatic and glomerular and hydrostatic and paratubular is going to be more significant if the efferent side is restricted. Okay? So you have a bigger drop in hydrostatic and the paratubular and a, the same or sizable increase in colloid osmotic pressure of the capillary bed by the time you get into paratubular capillaries. Both of those are going to um, help to promote reabsorption because the rise in the concentration of the colloid osmotic is not really that much more because you're going to hit that equilibrium point for filtration a little bit earlier, but the drop in the hydrostatic is much greater than usual. So it has a bigger impact because you're losing more of that hydrostatic than you are gaining in the colloid osmotic. That your Actually, yeah, I was kind of, since the blood flow is decreasing, um, is there like a possible balance point where the flow rate is the same as it was before, but your absor reabsorption is way higher? So you will, um, you will eventually have, um, it'll, it'll feed back. Once, once, this is mostly what you would do in response to, let's say you had a drop in blood pressure and you wanted to increase that blood pressure back up, you want to make sure that the kidney's being perfused the way that it is so the GFR stays as high, this is what you would do in response to that. And then once you have it back up to normal, it's going to shut off. Yeah. This is actually one of the big effects of the random intestinal aldosterone system, which we're going to get to in just a little bit. So, summary on the bottom. Increasing resistance before or after have opposite effects on GFR, despite the fact that both of them are going to slow down real blood flow. Anyone have any questions on this so far? Okay. This one I think is from the, it's either from Guyton Hall or it's from the Burning Levy. I think it's from Guyton Hall, but it's just a summary of the same thing that was not so clearly drawn from that one. Okay, I believe I gave you guys this one ahead of time because we have a couple of different uh, figures that I want to talk about really quickly, mainly because there is a little bit of a I guess biphasic effect that you would see for the efferent side. So if we're looking at the bottom, the bottom figure here is specifically addressing your afferent arteriolar resistance. This 
this guy down here. We're going to start with the bottom figure. Okay. So we're looking at our afferent arterial resistance, and starting on the x-axis at the bottom, we're increasing it fold, one fold, two fold, three fold. Like it's going to be starting at your baseline. What happens if you are one times the normal, so your normal rate, and then two times the normal rate, three times the normal rate in terms of the overall resistance, only on the afferent side. Okay. So if we're only on the afferent side, we see our renal blood flow, which is here in blue, and we have our glomerular filtration rate, which is here in red. What happens if you constrict on the afferent side? We see a decrease in both, right? We slow down our blood flow, and we slow down our glomerular filtration rate. We saw that because basically we're just squeezing the pipe that's letting blood come in, so everything is at a lower pressure, lower GFR, slower blood flow, they both move together and they stay in that same direction. The difference that we see for the efferent side <coughs> up here, there we go. the difference we see for the efferent side, on the right hand y-axis is renal blood flow, on the left hand y-axis is your G, uh, GFR. For the efferent side, we're looking at changes in resistance in the same basic steps one, two, three, four times. Under normal circumstances, constricting the efferent side will still see that decrease in blood flow. Okay, so your renal blood flow is going to go down. Your GFR is going to go up as you see a backup of fluid because you've constricted that to a small degree. That is going to happen. You will consistently see that increase unless you really increase the efferent arterial resistance two to three times normal. If it's above two to three times normal, what do you notice about your GFR? It starts to go down. Why? Because that's my blood. The blood flow. Because the blood flow has slowed down so much, your overall GFR is going to go down. The filtration itself is not affected as much. What we're talking about is the rate. Okay, so we're talking about how much is filtered per unit time. That's going to be an important distinction because you are still backing it up, you are still going to elevate your hydrostatic pressure, but if you constrict it so much where you basically are not moving fast enough to get sufficient amounts of blood in there per unit time, per minute, in order to continue to filter, the blood that's in there will already reach that equilibrium point, you've balanced out all of your pressures, and it's still flowing through halfway or two-thirds of the way through the glomerular capillaries with no net filtration happening. Okay, so the rate at which your overall filtration is occurring is going to slow down if you severely drop your renal blood flow. But that's only on the efferent side that you see that two biphasic approach. As long as it's moderate, normal levels up to two, two and a half times the normal resistance level, you'll see that increase in GFR as the backup in the hydrostatic pressure predominates. Once you get above that to about three times, now you start to see that decrease in, that two to three times, you're going to see that decrease in your GFR, okay, as the slowing down of your renal blood flow is now outweighing any benefits that you would have had to the increase in GFR. Okay? So, basically everything that we just talked about, except adding that little element of complexity to what actually happens based on how much you're, you're constricting that efferent side. Normal physiological circumstances, responses are going to be a sufficient amount to cause GFR to go up, but not so much vasoconstriction that it's actually going to start to go back down. Because the intention is to get it to go back up. Question? Is this similar uh, for going from to going from diffusion to perfusion limited? Like how would this compare to that? Oh, so this is always a Fusion, you can think of it as a perfusion limit. This, there's no problem 
with anything crossing over the barrier. It's just a question of how fast the blood is flowing and when you would hit that equilibrium point, if you would. Can you explain what's happening with the glomerular filtration rate? in the affian side where it appears to cross over the x-axis is it is the resistance so much that now you oh you mean down yeah. where it's like at three yeah so yeah approaching zero and then all of a sudden you have you basically you actually you get down to where you're not having any net filtration okay yeah thank you yeah i thought you were talking about on the, the left side where it surpasses the blue line but that's just because that would be dilation okay so how do we feel about this? Pretty good? This is going to become very important later on, so. Okay. All right. So, two pronged approach summarized in a different way. Instead of looking at a graph, we're going to do a little flow chart. If you increase your resistance on the efferent side, you have the elevated. Hydrostatic pressure, what does that do to GFR? What does that do? Higher hydrostatic and glomerular capillaries. It's going to increase, right? It has a positive effect. It's going to increase the rate of GFR current. What about the other side? You're going to slow down renal blood flow, which is going to concentrate your colloid osmotic pressure in the glomerular capillaries. What effect would that have on GFR? if it's slowed down sufficiently. It would have a negative effect. So whichever one of these is going to dominate is going to depend on the degree to which the resistance is occurring. Now, one thing that we haven't mentioned so far is something called your filtration fraction. Your filtration fraction, by definition, is how much of the fluid is being filtered based on all of the blood that's going through. So you're looking at your filtration rate divided by your renal plasma flow. Why is it plasma flow instead of blood flow? Cells your cells aren't going to filter, right? So we're looking specifically at your plasma flow. So how would you figure out your plasma flow rate? Renal blood flow times 1 minus the hematocrit, right? So the hematocrit, the value that you get is how much is cellular component. So if it's 0.4, the plasma would be 0.6, so it would be 1 <coughs> minus the hematocrit. And you would multiply the plasma portion times your blood to get the renal plasma flow rate. Okay, so it's the same thing that we had talked about before when we were looking at blood versus plasma back in uh, lecture 16. It's the same way that you would calculate that here. So your filtration fraction just compares Whatever your GFR is, so how much is being filtered per unit time, divided by how much blood is flowing through there, how much plasma is flowing through per unit time. So if we look at this up top, you can see a change in what happens from normal. What happens if you increase that filtration fraction. If you increase that filtration fraction, what do you see? What's over here on the y-axis? Let's make that a little bigger in case you're not looking on your actual device. Colloid osmotic pressure. So pi of GC can increase to a greater degree if you're filtering more fluid compared to how fast the fluid is moving. Okay, you're producing more filtrate per unit time compared to how fast that plasma is actually flowing through that capillary bed. That's all your filtration fraction is. How much of it is actually being filtered in a given time, usually per minute. Okay, if you drop that filtration fraction, you're not filtering as much. So you're not losing as much fluid, so you're not concentrating that colloid osmotic pressure in, in the capillary bed. Okay? So this, this graph is from the Guyton, and it just shows how filtration fraction, which is the relationship between GFR and RPF, it helps you to conceptualize at least a little bit what happens if you increase that or decrease that in terms of the overall effect that you would see inside the capillary bed. Okay, time for some
some questions. If you were to increase your ultrafiltration coefficient, what's that going to do to GFR? Mm -hmm. Why? Because you're multiplying that by all the other stuff. So whatever the effect is, because it's always going to be filtration at this point, okay? And because of that, you're going to have whatever number multiplied by your coefficient. If that goes up, GFR goes up. What about increasing your Bowman space hydrostatic pressure? It's going to decrease. Why? Because that would tend to push fluid back into the capillary bed. What about colloid osmotic glomerular capillaries? Which one? Decrease. Confidence, people. When you mumble, I can't tell if you're saying increase or decrease. All I hear is crease. It's <laughs> <laughs> like a crease. But I'm always right. So, yes, you're going to decrease your GFR. Why? You're concentrating the protein components, right? Those are going to oppose filtration. If you increase the filtration fraction based on the figure we just saw, what's that going to do? It's going to increase because you are filtering more fluid, which means you are going to concentrate that colloid osmotic pressure better, and eventually it's going to decrease GFR because you're already filtering a lot more. You're more efficient in the filtration rate compared to the renal plasma flow. What about hydrostatic pressure in your glomerular capillaries being increased? You're going to increase GFR. What if you constrict the afferent arterial? Increase. Increase or decrease? Decrease. Decrease PGC, decrease GFR. And if you constrict the efferent? Increase. Assuming it's not above two to three times the normal value, right? Because if it is, then you're slowing it down so much you're actually going to see that decrease. Okay, so. Normal vasoconstriction you see on the efferent side, you're going to see an increase in hydrostatic pressure and therefore an increase in GFR. This is the crux of what happens when we initiate the RAS system in order to get GFR back up to normal. I just have a quick question about the previous slide. When the filtration fraction increased, it looked like that it railed out the, the oncotic pressure at 40. Is What's going on there? Like reached the maximum before you oh. actually got to the end. Then. Is that like so? It's based on the the normal amount of proteins and those kinds of solutes that we normally contribute to that. It will actually reach a maximum based on the concentration that you have inside the body. Now you can raise your albumin levels. The liver can produce more albumin, and you can actually have a higher baseline value. But what it's saying is that by the time you get to the end, it will level off. And on average, it wouldn't be able to concentrate more than whatever the maximum amount is. So there's no more fluid going out past that point. Yes. Really yeah. When it, when it plateaus, you've, you've hit that point where it's balanced the ability to filter. OK. You guys remember these figures from cardiovascular? Or hemodynamics? These two refer to our two arterial orbits. That is why we have a relatively high, or comparatively high, AGC, and we have a comparatively low of your paratubular capillaries. Because we have now a second resistance vessel, right before our second capillary bed. So your glomerular capillaries are in the unique position of being surrounded by arterioles. We don't really see that elsewhere in the body. Those two sharp decreases are one of the things that not only helps tightly regulate the role of GFR in being able to maintain the body blood chemistry, but it also is one of the biggest uh, parameters that will help to promote reabsorption when you get to the paratubular side. So, if we're looking at our equation from the glomerulus, let me see if I can zoom in here. So, starting up here, you see that you have roughly zero for pi in the Bowman space. Your hydrostatic is about 10. At the beginning, you're looking at 
uh, hydrostatic of about 50 and your collar is not at 25. As the blood moves through and filtration is occurring, you'll raise that um, hydrostatic or raise that collar to 35. Hydrostatic goes down to 47. It's not much of a change, but the increase in the hydrostatic is significant. So we're going from 47 down to 20 because we're passing through a second resistance vessel. Okay. Just because you don't see that huge of a decrease in hydrostatic pressure coming out of the glomerular vocabularies doesn't mean that it's not really low by the time it gets to the paratubular side. Okay, normally it wouldn't be because you're passing through a venule which doesn't have the same ability to increase the overall resistance by shrinking the diameter. Your efferent arterial can, so you can see even though your hydrostatic, uh, sorry, even though your colloid osmotic isn't changing between those two points, end of the glomerular capillary, beginning of paratubular, you see a sharp decrease in hydrostatic. So those two together are the reason why you're going to see reabsorption occurring. Okay? And you'll still see that same drop, except you'll see that drop in hydrostatic on the paratubular side a little bit more as fluid is moving, but your solutes are not moving. But your fluid in this case is moving where? Your net movement is back in. Doesn't mean all your fluid's moving back in. You'll have some moving out, some moving in, but it's the net movement is going to show that um, you're going to have most of it coming back in, which means that you're going to dilute out those um, the colloid osmotic pressure. The biggest thing to pay attention to here is oh, here this one right here where it says PO and pi O. O, in this case, just means outside. Are we looking at the nephron tubular fluid itself? Nope. What are we looking at? Which is made up of interstitial fluid. Okay. Your capillary in the glomerulus has your basement membrane, right? You have your endothelial cells, your basement membrane, and then your sites for the epithelial cells. It's physically connected to Bowman space. And Bowman space is contiguous with the tubule. Once you get to the paratubular capillaries, they run alongside the nephron, but you don't have that close juxtaposition between the two. Instead, you have fluid that is being reabsorbed into the interstitium and then reabsorbed from the interstitium into the capillary bed. Okay? The reason that this is going to become important is because the interstitium is going to play a really big role, especially in the medulla, for concentrating your <coughs> the A gradient is going to be generated and maintained in order to determine the rate at which that concentration can occur because of solutes that can be stored and concentrated in various levels of the medullary interstitium. So we'll get to that. If you look at the ultrafiltration pressure, it's the same basic uh, setup that you would see for glomerular capillaries. You're looking at the pro-filtration and you're subtracting the um, pro-reabsorption. I think that's an easier way to think about it. The way that the boron book walks through it is it tells you that you take the hydrostatics and you subtract them and then you subtract the collar osmotics. I think it makes more sense to think about what's promoting filtration and subtract whatever's promoting reabsorption. In this case, if you set it up that way, what would be the sign of the resulting calculation you get from the paratubular catheters, positive or negative? Negative. Negative, right? You're getting the reabsorption here. If there's net reabsorption, how does the hydrostatic pressure still drop as it passes through the paratubular capillary? So the, you're talking about the PPC of 20 down to 15? Yeah. Okay. So what, what's happening? Well, you're not, you don't dilate the capillaries, but what, what's happening at this point? What are you moving in? Oh, into veins. You're moving into, well, you are moving into veins, but what else is coming along with your fluid? Whatever is Whatever solutes instead of being reabsorbed. So you also have to take into account that it's a balance between the overall 
amount of fluid and solutes that are being reabsorbed. So you are going to dilute out those solutes, but you are also slowing it down a little bit, and the pressure that is actually as it moves through there, you're slowing down the flow rate, you're going to slow down that pressure, the resistance isn't really changing at that point, and as it moves through, you will have a, a mild drop just as you move through that bed. So it's not something that is usually super uh, significant. It's not as big. It's actually a little bit bigger than what you see in the filtration side. But you do have a net flux of fluid moving in, but that doesn't mean that it's the only thing that's moving in. You have stuff moving in both directions. This is also the point where you could potentially have secretion. So you will have some fluid following the solutes that are being secreted. So like if you gave somebody an infusion of PAH, which is secreted, that will add fluid moving out as well. So when we're looking at the glomerular plasma flow, our ultra filtration pressure, we see that you, this yellow here shows that you have filtration, right? You have your concentration of your opposing filtration is actually less than the ones that will promote, so you have net filtration occurring. This absorptive pressure is the difference between what you see at the beginning and what you would see at the end. You have a relatively smaller absorptive pressure. As fluid is getting absorbed, you are going to have less of an impetus for fluid to move in the further along the capillary that you move. Similar to what we saw in the glomerulus where the further along the plasma moved, the less strength that was forcing that to get out into Bowman space. These are just from the Boron book, and it's just a visual representation to show that if we're looking at the ones that would promote reabsorption, the, those are going to consistently be higher all the way along the paratubular capillary, but the degree to which that reabsorption occurs is going to dwindle. All right, so, oops, sorry. First, this is from the Boron book looking at PAH, and then we're going to look at annulum. Okay, PAH is something that you don't normally produce, that's that row amino hipparate. It's something that you can give as an infusion. Inulin is a fructose-like starch that comes from the Jerusalem artichoke. So again, you don't make it. It's something that is isolated and done as an infusion in order to determine the clearance rate. If we're looking at PAH, it's processed <clears throat> on a single pass-through of blood. As the plasma moves through the nephrons, one time, from artery down the vein, all of your pH is going to be cleared. It is filtered, and then it is secreted. So by the time you get to the renal vein, provided you are not flooding the body with excessive amounts, it will be completely cleared. So if it's completely cleared on one passage, clearance of this will determine renal plasma flow because the rate at which PAH is completely clear is equal to the rate at which blood flows through the kidney. There's nothing left on the renal vein. Okay? So you have a set filtered load, and then you still have some that is coming through the efferent arterial, but all of that will be secreted into the nephron. So that whatever you started with, in this case it was 60 mg per minute, the all 60 mg per minute is going to come out in the urine. Okay? Does everybody see how the clearance of PAH equates to renal plasma flow? Okay, we're looking at what is the rate at which this compound is removed from the plasma. It's removed at whatever rate the plasma is moving because it's completely removed on a single passage through the kidney. Okay, so if you want to calculate renal plasma flow, you pick something that's cleared on a single passage. If anything's left over in the renal vein, it's not completely clear. <clears throat> it won't give you a completely accurate level of renal plasma flow. Inulin, the great part about inulin is that it is not capable 
of moving once it's been filtered. It's only about five kilodaltons, so it's small. It's really easy for it to be filtered across. It's freely filtered, along with any other small solute, but there is no way for it to be reabsorbed or secreted. Why? Because we don't produce it. So why would we make a transporter that can specifically move this particular molecule? There's no reason. So, inulin is used a lot to determine GFR. The only way you get inulin in the urine is however much is filtered. So whatever the rate is that inulin is removed from the plasma and shows up in the urine, is going to be the same as the rate at which it was filtered because it's not processed anywhere else along the nephron. Now, you can do this with an endogenous compound to your body. Anybody know what that is? Creatinine. Creatinine is something that your body will produce, that you can use as an estimate for GFR. It's not perfect, okay? Inulin would be a more accurate example, but you have to do an infusion. You can measure the clearance of creatinine because it's naturally produced in your body, and then all you have to do is take a blood sample, a urine sample, and flow right, and you're good. But it can be secreted a little bit, okay? So you will actually have just a little bit more showing up in the urine than you would have being filtered along. So it can slightly overestimate your GFR, but it's a really good endogenous estimate. So you don't have to do an infusion. You could just collect your samples, run your test, and get a pretty good representation of what your GFR is. Okay? Um, Mannitol would be another example of something that would function this way that's not reabsorbed and not secreted. Mannitol is something that's actually used when you need to remove fluid. It's a diuretic, but it's an osmotic diuretic, which we'll talk about in a little bit, because it's processed in a similar way to inulin. So this is just the same figures that we showed a second ago. Your, uh, sorry. Your PAH clearance is used to estimate what parameter? Rate of plasma flow. Inulin clearance is used to measure what? GFR. You can also use creatinine, but it's slightly over or under. Overestimate GFR. Because you can get a little bit of creatinine being secreted in the tubular portion. But it's still used because it's a lot easier than hooking somebody up and doing an infusion. All right. So, if we're looking at renal blood flow. Who recognizes this equation? <laughs> Have we had enough of this equation? <laughs> Ohms of law. Pressure difference between your renal artery and your renal vein. The resistance, you have to take into account three different parameters now instead of just two. Because we have two arterioles. So you have to look at the resistance of the afferent arterial, the resistance of the efferent arterial, and the resistance of the venule. The resistance of the venule isn't going to be as subject to such tight scrutiny in terms of being able to constrict or dilate because, remember, it has relatively discontinuous vascular smooth muscle cell. It does have some. It's just not that many. So you can still have some constriction. It's just relatively low. So you have to add up all of the vasculature that's in the kidney in order to get that total resistance. Now, this is something that we already sort of mentioned. So we can take a second and respond. The question is asking about why do you do the kidneys? Why are they privileged enough to get a lot more nutrients and oxygen than they need just for their normal cellular metabolism to maintain their life? Cellular life requires a certain amount of energy just for normal cellular processes. Why does the kidney need a lot more oxygen and a lot more nutrients? Hmm. 
lots and lots and lots of transporters, but it's an indirect way of fueling your transporters. Why? You have some transporters that require you to do directly, but most of them are going to use what? Which other ion? Sodium. And how do we get a sodium gradient? Sodium potassium pump. And what does that need? ATP. Okay, so we're going to have your basal oxygen consumption is relatively low. But your kidneys eat up about 7 to 10% of all the oxygen consumption in your whole body because they need to produce massive amounts of ATP in order to maintain that sodium gradient so that all these transporters can function. You won't get any glucose or amino acid reabsorption if you don't have that sodium gradient, period. That's the only way that your glucose and your amino acids are going to be reabsorbed in the proximal tube. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about, okay, we're getting quite close. Let's talk about our different ways of regulating our GFR and our renal blood flow. We have neurohumoral and local, so your intrinsic mechanisms that are just something that would happen inside the kidney as opposed to getting a neurological signal or a hormone signal. Your sympathetic nervous system has a much bigger impact on your <coughs> afferent arterioles than it does on your efferent arterioles. And the result is that because you're constricting more on the afferent side than the efferent, you will end up with a reduction in GFR and a big slowing down of your renal blood flow. This is something that would happen if you had a massive loss of volume. Angiotensin II, aside from just promoting the release of um, aldosterone is it has its own activities. It mainly will act on the efferent side. It has a little bit of an activity on the afferent side too, but that is actually balanced. That vasoconstrictor effect that you would see on the afferent side is balanced out by the nitric oxide and the prostaglandin vasodilator effects that happen on the afferent side. So there isn't really that significant of a vasoconstrictor effect before the glomerular capillaries. So GFR doesn't change because the whole reason you get angiotensin II is because that cascade is triggered in response to a decrease in GFR. So by constricting the efferent side, you're basically bringing GFR back up to where it should be. So it's a maintenance signal. Okay, It will slow down the renal blood flow, but it's there to maintain your GFR. It also will promote sodium reabsorption because it will stimulate the expression of sodium proton exchangers in the tubule as well as epithelial sodium channels that promote reabsorption, which will help to increase fluid retention. That's in addition to its effects on aldosterone, which also promotes sodium reabsorption. So angiotensin II a lot of times doesn't get full credit for all that it does. It is a big workhorse that doesn't just give aldosterone its signal, which does a lot of the heavy lifting for sodium, but it specifically will target that efferent side, and it will promote the constriction of those vascular smooth muscle cells. So if you have volume depletion or you have a low sodium diet, anything that's going to need you to get more volume and more sodium back into the body would be something that would trigger the release of renin, which would function as an enzyme to convert angiotensinogen, which is just floating around your body all the time, into angiotensin one. Angiotensin 1 will be converted by angiotensin converting enzyme into angiotensin 2, which then will trigger a whole bunch of stuff, including the release of aldosterone. That's specifically due to a loss of GFR, or loss of volume. Prostaglandins, as I said before, they have a big effect on the afferent side to cause vasodilation. They have a moderate effect on the efferent side, but both of them are going to result in dilation, which means a higher hydrostatic pressure entering into the glomerulus, so you're going to elevate your GFR. If you block prostaglandin synthesis, you'll end up with a decrease in GFR. This is a baseline production. You will have this set effect that can be balanced if you lose volume by the release of angiotensin II. 
endothelial-derived nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, which we talk about in 503, does what to smooth muscle cells for those of you that were here last month? It triggers relaxation. Okay, if you're going to relax your smooth muscles, what are you going to do to your blood vessel? You're going to dilate it. Okay, so <clears throat> if it's endothelial derived nitric oxide factor, that's what that comes from, it's coming from what type of cell? Which surround? Blood vessel. Right? Endothelial cells are lining your blood vessels. Okay? As opposed to epithelial cells. So these, this is nitric oxide that's actually derived from your cells surrounding the blood vessels. This is something that can help to protect against too much constriction of your vessels. This will be really important specifically because of the role of endothelin. Endothelin has massive vasoconstrictive effects, mostly on the afferent side because its job is to reduce GFR. These are a few examples. If you have somebody who's hypertensive, if you have somebody who has hepatorenal syndrome, hepatorenal syndrome is something where you have the cirrhosis of the liver that has a backup effect on the kidneys themselves. The kidneys will respond to cirrhosis and an increase in blood pressure, portal hypertension, which is just increased blood pressure of the portal vein going into the liver. Because of that backup, it actually will cause um, vasoconstrictive effects that would happen inside of the kidney. And so this is a complication that can lead to uh, renal failure. All of these things are specifically triggered by endothelin. But endothelin doesn't just cause this constriction. It also helps to trigger its own um, relaxation to help maintain its value so that it doesn't get too excessively constricted. So if you take a treatment where you antagonize endothelin, it can actually help to reduce that amount of constriction and basically bring your GFR and your renal blood flow back up if there's a problem with perfusion. The reason I bring that up is specifically looking at the effects that we'll see for ET1. ET1 is your endothelin. It can bind to a couple of different receptors. Okay? There are ETA receptors and there are ETB receptors. Depending on what type of cell you're looking at, the same compound can trigger different responses. Okay? When we're talking about your smooth muscle cell, sorry, vascular smooth muscle cell, you get contraction. Okay? Primarily because of the stimulus of that ETA uh, receptor. Because that one is, is coupled with a GQ, G protein, it will result in elevated levels of calcium. So for any kind of muscle, you elevate calcium, you stimulate contraction. Okay, so when endothelin 1 binds to its receptor on smooth muscle, you get contraction. When endothelin 1 binds to its receptor on the endothelial cells of the blood vessels, it stimulates ENOS, which is endothelial nitric oxide synthase, to produce nitric oxide. That nitric oxide will diffuse into that vascular smooth muscle, and it will inhibit contraction. So when endothelin is released, you actually get an initial dilation followed by a more sustained contraction, mainly because the contraction signal is a GPCR, which is a longer lasting signal. So it sort of self-regulates, so you don't have excessive vasoconstriction, because it also stimulates a dilation signal as well. Okay? So, same exact compound, two different effects based on the expression of the receptors on those different cell types. But we're looking at vascular smooth muscle and vascular endothelium, so they're right next to each other. Any nitric oxide produced from arginine in the endothelial cells diffuses right across. So even though endothelin has the effect of ramping up constriction, usually
usually the initial thing, as soon as it's released, is you would actually see relaxation. You'd see a little bit of dilation that is relatively short-lived before that constriction comes in, and it helps to tamper the degree of constriction. So how do we feel? Pretty good? I hope. Or will I be seeing a lot of people not? <laughs> All right, so this is just a summary of what we had just talked about, how these particular parameters, if you increase each of these, what's going to happen to GFR and renal blood flow. Now, let's get into our local control. So that was your neurohumoral control. Now we're going to look at the local control. We have the myogenic mechanism. We have the macula densa feedback, which is your tubuloglomerular feedback. Tubulo referring to the renal tubule feeding back on the glomerulus. That's the macula densa, which is in the distal tubule, that goes right back to in between the afferent and efferent arterial so that it can communicate with those blood vessels on GFR. We also have angiotensin II, which is going to be a mediator that will play a role in this local control. So what normally happens is if we're looking at, over time, we're starting with renal artery pressure, GFR, and renal blood flow rate. If there's a drop in arterial pressure, What's going to happen to GFR? It's going to decrease. Renal blood flow will decrease too because you've just lost a bunch of pressure, so the perfusion to the kidney is going to drop. But the kidney itself will auto-regulate. It will respond to that loss in pressure, and it will be able to bring its GFR and its blood flow rate back up based on these myogenic mechanisms, which I'll talk about in just a second. If you were to increase pressure, what do you think would happen to GFR and renal blood flow? They're going to increase, but the autoregulation will allow it to come back down. It won't come all the way back down, because in this case we're looking at a significant increase in the arterial pressure. So the myogenic mechanism can regulate fairly well, and it allows the kidneys to be able to adapt to a wide range of pressures, but it's not perfect. Mainly the reason is, if we're, this is from the Boron book, if we look at GFR on the bottom and renal blood flow in the middle, the vascular resistance effects that we're going to see are relatively constant for your arteriolar and venous resistance. It's going to decrease a little bit, and then it's going to maintain at higher pressures relatively steady. The biggest change that you're going to see is that increase in afferent arterial resistance. And by doing that, that's something that we're going to be able to see. The balancing between the afferent and the efferent is what helps to stabilize GFR and renal blood flow over a wide range of pressures. Now, why do we care about this? The autoregulation itself, if we look at our arterial pressure, GFR, and reabsorption, 100 for your millimeters of mercury. Your GFR is um, around 125 liters a day in this person. If you reabsorb 124, you're producing about a liter of urine a day. That's fine. You can handle that. Okay? What happens if GFR goes up and your reabsorption doesn't change? Arterial pressure went to 120. GFR went up to 150. Reabsorption is now still 124. What do you have? Can you imagine producing 26 liters of urine a day? I'm sorry, but your bladder cannot hold that much. You will be living in the bathroom. <laughs> so, if you have good autoregulation, but you don't change tubular reabsorption, you get 6 liters. So, still more than probably you'd be particularly happy with, but that same increase in arterial pressure resulted in a moderate increase in GFR compared to what would happen if their kidneys were completely incapable of regulating itself. Okay? If you have good autoregulation and the tubules themselves can adapt, that tubular glomerular filtration rate can adapt to help maintain and trigger the signals that will increase or decrease reabsorption, in this case, you want to increase it because you're elevating the arterial pressure and perfusion. Now, we're looking at an extra 200 mils. So you're going from 100 to, or sorry, 1 liter to 1.2. 
that's manageable. So if we didn't have auto regulation and we didn't have the ability to send humoral signals to increase the rate of reabsorption, if you had an increase in blood pressure, you'd be producing a lot of fluid. And because you'd be producing a lot of fluid, you'd also need to drink a lot of fluid. All right, we got three minutes left. I know you're getting anxious, but three more minutes, and then we'll be done. So this is going to walk, we're going to walk through first specifically the myogenic mechanism. If you increase arterial pressure, the first thing that's going to happen is you're increasing the blood flow. You're increasing perfusion because the pressure is higher. You haven't changed any resistance. So if P goes up, Q goes up. So blood flow is going to go up. That's going to cause the blood vessels to stretch. More blood, more pressure going in. You have stretch receptors inside of your blood vessels that are going to respond to an increase in this distension. That will trigger an increase in mechanically gated calcium channels, which cause calcium to come in. If calcium comes in, intracellular calcium levels are going to go up. What is that going to do? It's going to cause the vascular smooth muscle cells to contract. When that contracts, you increase the resistance. What does that do to your blood flow? It slows it down. So the kidneys themselves, when they sense, because they're being stretched, that excess amount of pressure, that excess amount of flow, it will trigger this cascade so that those smooth muscle cells will constrict those blood vessels going into the kidney so that the flow doesn't raise so much. So your GFR doesn't increase as much as it would without this mechanism in place. The juxtaglomerular apparatus, this is your macula densa, which we talked about before. So we have our distal convoluted tubule, the end of your thick ascending limb, the beginning of the distal tubule is where your macula densa cells are. They are going to be juxtaposed right with your afferent and efferent arterioles, and they are going to sense the sodium level that is present at the end of the nephron. So if your GFR drops, you're going to have less salt getting to the end. These macula densa cells are specialized cells that actually have a lot of Golgi, which indicates that they have a great degree of ability to produce secretory compounds. So it's going to produce these chemicals that they can secrete onto your afferent and efferent arterioles. They can regulate the degree of constriction. So when that sodium is dropped at the distal part of the nephron, that macula densa cell will decrease that, they'll sense that decrease in sodium chloride reabsorption. What are they going to do? It's going to say we need to reduce that afferent arterial resistance. Why are GFR is too low? We're not getting sufficient fluid, sufficient salt coming through here. So we need to send a signal to dilate the afferent arterial to try and bring our G GFR back up. So GFR is going to return to normal which will feed back and actually increase the amount of salt going to the macular vessels, and so they will stop secreting those mediators. Angiotensin II, just give me one minute because I'm right at the very end. Angiotensin II, if you have a drop in GFR, you'll see that the macula densa also has lower sodium. That is going to cause the juxtaglomerular cells in that juxtaglomerular apparatus to release renin. Renin eventually will produce angiotensin II, which will result in that increase in blood pressure and efferent arterial resistance. If you do this, you're going to elevate the pressure hydrostatic inside the capillaries, which will help to bring your GFR back up to normal. This is just a flow chart that shows you what happens if you have a drop, and it shows you the effect on the efferent side and the afferent side of the macula densa, both of which are going to bring GFR back up. And this is a summary slide that just gives you kind of a big overview of what happens in your kidneys when systemic blood pressure drops. So we're going to cover the rest of these um, as we continue through the, the renal portion. But today we covered myogenic, we covered tubuloglomerular, and we covered neural control.